if you're picking up an old dog that has no plan going forward, that's a very challenging proposition because the question is, what's different this time than the last time or the time before? If you look at some of the more notable recent successes, um, they're all people who have a, have, a, they have a little bit of experience, they have a little bit of money, but they're not, you know, they're not wed to specific ideologies. You have to have exposure to pounds that will be the low cost half. Mm -hmm. So having pounds isn't enough. It's about cost pounds that, that have potential. Uh, we've certainly seen utility interest in the term market increase. Man, there's decisions going to be made by the utilities pretty, pretty soon, or they're going to be running up against challenges. But I think we've moved that 2025 supply deficit to pretty much, we're pretty much there now. Looking at the companies around you, like in the basin, around the basin, are there any juniors worth taking a deeper look at in the basin right now? And if yes, what exactly would you be looking for if you were, you know, in my shoes, a retail investor looking to grow your capital? What are you, what are you looking for exactly? Well, I, I think you want to look at companies that one have enough land, not just a tiny piece of land, like you can do a deal on a posted stamp. Uh, you want to find companies that are going to bring you an opportunity to follow up what they already know. And, and what I mean by that, I think the last run in the cycle was a really good example. Uh, I think if I recall correctly, in the run up last time from 2005 to 2007, there was something like $3 billion raised for uranium companies globally uh, and invested in the space. And because the uranium industry had been sitting for 20, 25 years languishing and there was no junior sector, it took the learning curve to get up, the get up the learning curve took two and a half to three years. So just as some companies are getting dangerous, the market turned on them. Uh, that won't be the case this time because there's a lot more knowledge out there than there was in the past. But if you're looking at a company that says, I got a chunk of land, I've staked some brand new land, um, we like this opportunity uh, and we were hoping to find a conductive trend, you're at the extreme early end of the stage. And you could hit the Grand Slam home run, but they're probably two or three years away from being able to put that drill program that meets the meat that you want to have done. So you want to talk about properties and projects where people are saying, I'm following up something that's got a sniff of something already. Uh, we got the land already. Uh, we know where the, the corridor you want to be on is already. And not just where, but where within the corridor you want to be on. Mm. And so there are some companies like that out there. There's a lot of newer companies out there that, that will struggle. And, you, and then you want to honestly bet on the team's technical ability. You know, there's the, there's, there's the, I do not pretend. Um, I, I still talk about the old guard, even though I guess I'm now one of the old guard in the uranium space. But, you know, companies that are going to let the rocks tell them where to go versus try to force things to be done. And it's a strange, strange scenario. Um, it's hard to believe that uh, that people will want to will have be so predisposed possessed to find a certain style deposit versus letting things happen. And so, if you know the strangest part about the last decade in the Athabasca Basin is that who's making the discoveries, and they're the groups that are that have very strong technical teams who aren't wed to a single idea. And so, you want to be able to, to pick those out. When when I look at uh, when I look at teams, I look at the, I look at that ability to be. You want some uranium expertise, but you also want some open eye to this. Mm -hmm. and I think that's that's key. When I when I look at our team, that's exactly what we recruit for. Our team, our our team is 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 very focused on looking for the things that people missed, and not because they did it wrong, but they followed a recipe up front mm -hmm. back in the eighties and looking you know looking for particular types of deposits when the new deposits are being found in similar but different environments. And that's kind of where our strength is. That's what our team's history, even before UX. Uh, had a history of doing just exactly that. Okay, that's interesting that you sh should say that because I I spoke to somebody whose whole team was basically made out of of people who had experience in raising capital, not so much in employing capital into the ground. And so now you're saying you need a strong technical team first, and all the rest comes second. And it makes sense because if the green market is hot, raising money will not be as hard if you have a strong technical team who's proving results. Um, so it makes sense. Yeah. If, you, if you're a brand new company on a single property, uh, you have, how many times does the market give you to take a crack at something before they get tired of it? <laughs> not, not many, I'd guess. Yeah. 
So, you know, part of, part of the challenge is being persistent, but I, I do think, you know, you look at some of the more notable recent successes, um, they're all people who have a, have, a, they have a little bit of experience, they have a little bit of money, but they're not, you know, they're, they're not wed to specific ideologies. Okay, and that's specifically, we're talking explorers here. What if we start looking at the companies who've done a little bit of work and know somewhat of, of what they have in the ground, maybe development companies, stuff like that? What do you, if again, you're a retail investor, let's say, what, 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 do you, what would you use to make a decision? Like, is it a ratio of like an EV to pounds in the ground? Is it the ability to transact or mine those pounds profitably? How are you? How would you be looking at this if we're talking about companies that are a little bit further in their stage? Uh, I, I think it comes down to, is there, is, there, is there visibility towards, if you're a development company, is there visibility towards production? And it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, 10 zillion pounds a year. Is there visibility in a plan to get you to, to the promised land uh, versus someone picking up a piece of land and saying, you know, I've had this, it was, it was sitting around, uh, it sat around in the seventies and it couldn't get mined. It sat around in the eighties and couldn't get mined. Um, I, I think it's, it, it's very project specific, but I also think you want to find properties that have give you opportunity to be in the low cost half in the uranium space mm-hmm. um, to pick up pounds that come in at 80, $85 probably won't be rewarded in the marketplace today. If you're picking up an old dog that has no plan going forward, that's a very challenging proposition because the question is what's different this time than the last time or the time before mm-hmm. in terms of conditions. That's a very fair question. It's one that I've asked to a couple of CEOs and I don't always like the answer, <laughs> but what if you were to use those metrics and, um, this is another hypothetical game. We can call it the Russian truth or dare. And it's not racist because I'm from Eastern Europe, so I can say that. But, okay. uh, <laughs> you know, if you, who would you, and I, I would appreciate it if you could drop a name or you would, it, it's a gun to your head scenario, right? You, you either have to say a name or you, you'd take the bullet or you, but <laughs> that's why I call it that way. But who would you switch, switch places with? Like, if, again, if there was a gun to your head scenario, you had to pick a uranium company, circa your market cap to switch places with or take the bullet, who would you switch places with? Uh, that are in our same market cap scenario, sorry? Yeah, okay, yeah. That, that's hard because we're in that weird spot where nobody else seems to be in the market cap space. Um, and so, yeah, if you told me I could switch places with next gen, of course I would do that. <laughs> Everybody would. I would um, too, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so that, that if you're talking market cap size, you're probably, uh, you would take, uh, whether you consider, you know, would, would Fission be that one company? I'm not sure that's the one for us, although it would be a pretty good switch. Uh, I think they're both ways, more of a win-win. Uh, I'm not going to count Denison because they're much, much larger market cap yeah. than us. Um, yeah. When I look, so that, you know, when you start looking around the rest of the Athabasca Basin, um, it's a very, you know, you have, you have ISO energy with their hurricane discovery. And I think at the end of the day, um, that's pretty intriguing. I do like our portfolio a little bit better. You start looking, you have to start looking internationally, whether it's US or, or abroad. And I, I think similar market size cap companies that when I look at their project, I'm not, I'm not as excited about them. So I, I would, I would, uh, if I were to sit there and say, you know, maybe maybe it's ISO or Fission uh, okay. for the Alaska. When I look abroad um, to companies, um, I think our board and, and our management team really believe strongly that you have to have exposure to pounds that will be the low cost half. Mm-hmm. So having pounds isn't enough. It's about cost pounds that that have potential. And I think for us. When we look at when you look at the Athabasca Basin and everyone, and everyone who's outside the Athabasca, all oh, these Athabasca people talk about the Athabasca. If a project can go in the Athabasca Basin, you know it's going to be in that low cost half, generally speaking, because almost they almost always happen. Uh, when you look around the rest of the world, there are certainly projects outside of Kazakhstan, which is impossible for the junior place junior port to play in. Um, you there are certainly projects, but not districts that fit that role. So you can't go into certain districts and say, if a project is here as an investor, that probably is going to meet the economic threshold if it's successful, um, going towards production, whereas a project might be. Mm. That, I don't know if I made that very clear, but it's a one-off case in every other district outside the Athabasca Basin as mm-hmm. to whether they're 
and generally Athabasca projects that hit critical mass and size will be economic. And that'll okay. cost. No, that makes sense. You know, you you were talking about the the, the um, U.S. companies. There's a couple of companies that I like over there, and that made me think: if you don't like the projects, is there is there maybe a person from wherever you want in the world within the uranium industry that you would give anything for to join your team? <laughs> oh, that's a that's a really great question. I, I think. <sighs> I've spoken to very many of them, and there's just, I feel like I like them almost all. There is a maybe two I, I, I that I don't really it, like, but um, I think if you're looking from the US, I think Amir Danny and, and UEC uh, and what they've done there, it creates, uh, he's really good at exp- being able to explain value of what, what they have. And I think he's exceptional with that, and he'd be a, a great addition to our team. Uh, I, I would look at, um, if I'm, I'm thinking out in a broad, uh, outside of, you know, I, I have never really thought about that question. So that's a, that, that's one that, uh, that's intriguing to me. Uh, I like, um, uh, I, there's a, there's a fellow on it that I've worked with in the past who used to be at next gen. Who's now at March and metals, uh, Troy Bojale. I, I really like him. He's, uh, he'd be someone I'd love to add to our team as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, fair enough. No, I was a little bit surprised by you mentioning um, Mr. Nanny, but it made sense. You know, if you're looking for for somebody to sort of tell the story in your company, given that you just told me, you know, you're pretty happy with what you have in the ground. So, okay, fair enough. Um, if you know, when we're talking about how you would act as a as a retail investor here, it's it's interesting to me to to sort of talk about what you what your general outlook on the market is like you know we've 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 had this sharp rise in in the spot price uh right after spot joined the market less than a year ago but it's been sort of trending down really not even calm i was gonna say calm but it was sort of like you know dropping Mm -hmm. off a little bit by a little bit and most people are, are you know they're they're not getting the, the, the move that they desire, I guess, not as quickly as they wanted it to happen. So what's your general outlook in 2022? And, and what do you think needs to happen in order for, for us to see another leg up, basically? Uh, I think I'm a, I'm a little more simplistic than, than most in terms of you. The, your, every pound of uranium sold in the spot market, with the exception of that now that's going into the, the spot fund, mm. uh, destined for utility in the term market at some point in time or another. Uh, whether it's a hedge fund or not, it all has to go into a term contract in the future. So term contracting and the return of of true long-term contracting is probably the number one driver and it's the most opaque part of the entire industry uh, because it's not something you can see very easily. It's reported in some of the trade magazines and such. Uh, We've certainly seen utility interest in the term market increase but I think it's one of these games where um, buyers want today's price and the long-term suppliers are saying, guys, we can't work that pace. And they're trying to find that price level. And that, has, that price discovery hasn't quite happened yet. But as we get to the end of 2022, you're going to be looking without term contracting in place and looking at how much truth been transacted on the market over the last decade um, Man, there's decisions that are going to be made by the utilities pretty pretty soon, or they're going to be running up against challenges. Uh, I think, you know, and this, and this is a little bit supported by how um, the market the market always works backwards from the from the utility end of point of view. So if you look at what's changed in the last eighteen months in SWU or your Richmond market, mm-hmm. seeing Richmond prices zoom up. So if you're a utility, right, and you're going to buy uranium. What do you have? What do you need to do to turn that into fuel pellet? Well, you got to secure fuel manufacturing or pellet manufacturing. You got to secure enrichment. You got to secure conversion. So you do all those things first, and then you go buy the uranium because otherwise you have the uranium sitting idle. And I think you've seen utilities actually do all that, and now they're trying to find the price that they want for the uranium. So I, I do believe that really does come to a head this year. The the, the ability to just defer purchases is going to be much more challenging, for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the biggest bellwether of all will be the return of MacArthur River uh, production because they hit that price. And I think that's the, that's the bellwether, right? Um, if, if 
if they get their price to put long-term contracting in place, then you'll see that return to the market, but it won't be, it'll be seen as new pounds, but not really. Mm-hmm. When you look at, uh, from a, from a retail investor point of view, um, I think the challenge is in the past before Sprott, uh, everyone was used to volatility, but generally downward volatility to bad news. So what I mean by that is you, you'll you sit there and see, you know, someone's going to take a reactor offline and there'll be a little dip in the price or the equities. Uh, what you're seeing now is, is, is not just a sawtooth pattern down, but a sawtooth pattern up. So you're seeing things like the taxonomy in, the, in, the, in Europe here uh, come into play. You're seeing the impact of, of spot purchases from spot fraught in a short period of time. And there's a lot more volatility in the upward direction. So you're seeing both upward and downward volatility, which I can't really say you've, even in the last run up, you never got upward spikes. You got downward spikes on the way up. And, and I think now you're seeing both. And so it's, it's a wilder ride for your retail investor and your institutional investor. You know, it's, it's a wilder ride because there are ups and downs. And yeah. you see it in the price of uranium equities um, because you, you look at you, I look at our stock price, you're going, okay, <laughs> in the last month, we were, you know, 42 cents and 28 cents and everything in the middle, boom, boom, two cent, variety, three cent moves every day up and down, mm-hmm. um, which is a little, you know, we haven't seen that kind of volatility in, in the equities um, for, you know, when someone makes a new discovery, things take off for that company, no doubt. But the volatility in, in, in day to day is just, it's, it's very hard for investors. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, hard definitely. You know, I joked about it on Twitter, but my wife um, broke her leg a while ago. I didn't joke about that, but uh, otherwise I would be sleeping on the couch, but she broke her leg and then she had to go into like, uh, you, you know, just sort of to fix it and stuff like that. And the doctor told her that she should try and get her heart rate up at least once a week for like 30 minutes. And I was like, oh, well, that's easy. You should just invest in uranium stocks, get your heart rate up like throughout the whole week just by looking at your portfolio. And it, it was a joke, but it was kind of painful because it's true. Um, now, you know, it's nice to, to kind of look at this through the lenses of someone who took part in the last cycle as, as an insider. And in doing that, I'm just wondering, how are you, how are you experiencing this cycle so far relative to how you've experienced the previous cycle? Like, is it almost the same for you? Does it look more like the one from the seventies rather than the one from the, you know, up until 2007 or is like the, the you know, by the way, that's the, the you know, that, that, that those are the four most dangerous words in investing, but is this time around, is it, is it different you know, people say this time it's different. What do, you, what do you think about all that? How are you experiencing this cycle, Roger? If I were to go back to, say, November and work forward from November, uh, I would have argued that that's the Sprott impact with the ATM was very similar. And it looked a whole lot like, like pre-2000, like October 2006 and earlier, where you saw a gradual run in the price uh, and then weird supply interruption events that happened along the way. Uh, what you're not seeing, and so Sprott is a supply interruption event, even though it's not supply, uh, the primary supply production issues like Ranger flood, MacArthur flood, and Cigar Lake floods. Um, it's about supply being removed from the market in a permanent way. And so I find that to be very similar, but I think, I think the difference this time versus last time is, in, is, is so much more in the investor behavior. There's so much more knowledge about the uranium space than there was last time. So you do, you do see, you know, last time was always going up, forever going up. I think people are a little more, and there's more advice out there about, about where the market, especially spot market movements are. And so there's a little more cautiousness in the space, mm-hmm. uh, despite the fact things moved really quickly. If you, if you, uh, you know, um, but prior to Sprott, I would have said, all things are lining up. The path is actually in the same way it's going. So you're 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 one supply interruption challenge away from a serious deficit that's that even the utilities can't deny. Okay, that's a lot strong. a lot of well, you know, I think even the most pessimistic experts a year ago would have said that we're in a structural deficit in 2025. That's, that's not going to change. And you add the COVID thing and see pounds being taken out of the market. And then you see Sprott take out 25% of the, of the annual market 
in a couple of month period of time, that amount of that amount of pounds being taken out of the market was the equivalent of Cigar Lake being shut down. Oh, yep. And, and that flood, you know, there was there was twenty million pounds that were going to go into the market that didn't show up in the market, and there's potential for that to happen for the next couple of years. So I, I kind of see them as similar events. Although, I'm sorry, similar impact events on the market, even though they're manifest in a different way. Um, and and it was just it was it was the it was the perception. When you, when, you, when you look at fuel buyers, right, it's security supply is the by, by far the most important thing. We, we saw real, you know, seeing price of, of, of the uranium move a dollar in a day. That's not a usual event you see very often until more recently. You know, people get jittery about Kazakhstan and the recent developments there and how that will serve supply. We see there's just so much more, you know, one big mine goes down and you take, 10, 15 million more pounds out of the market. What impact will that have? And yeah. I think that's in, in terms of buyer behavior. I think that's that's probably your one event away from something like that. Whether that event happens or not is debatable. But I think we've moved that 2025 supply deficit to pretty much we're pretty much there now. Mm-hmm. It's been moved forward through the through the depletions. Yeah, you know, call me naive, but I want to say the four most dangerous words that I just feel like this time it's really different. I might be naive, but I just what I think also because to add to what you just, just said, I recently read somewhere that this cycle could even continue a while longer simply because of how challenging it is to bring on supply this time around versus how you know easy it wasn't really easy last time around, but it, it just takes more time right now. It takes more effort, it takes more money. There's more permitting, there's more, there's more challenges, there's social distancing, whatever you want to add to it. It's just it seems more more effort to bring on new supply and, and even su- existing supply to bring it back online. It seems like more effort than last time. And, and actually, more importantly, more, you know, all this results in more time to bring a project online, which would, it, it, you know, it might mean that it just could take a while longer for the supply to increase to a level where it matches the demand, especially now, as you mentioned, the financial players are essentially becoming an, 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 an additional end user because those pounds are not coming out of it's not like you know sprint is not going to start selling them once the price is you know 80 dollars. that's just not how the vehicle is set up it's just it's an end user end user of uranium basically um which i think i think too there's a big difference this time around than last uh when we started the last cycle um the world produced about 50 percent of the pounds they needed because there was stockpile sitting out there and that's changed it's no longer you know you're looking more like 80 percent of of demand but there was Kazakhstan, there was Kazakhstan, there was Kazakhstan to save the buyers last time. And, and if you go back in the last cycle and look at how much Kazakhstan or Kazakh, Kazakhs produced in 2004 and five compared to what they produce today, that whole slack was taken up by, by Kazakh, Kazakh, Kazakhstan, excuse me. Um, and, and so they went from sort of like five to 10 million pounds a year to 60 million pounds a year in that window. And that, that, that satisfied all the demand issues. Mm-hmm. Now, there's, there's certainly a little bit of room in, Ka- in Kazakhstan to grow, but it's not grow to change the universe. And so there's nothing sitting out there right now to say, you know, the next 40 million pounds of demand that is going to be coming through all the structurally different changes that have happened in, in the nuclear environment in the last year or a couple of years, so acceptance of nuclear as clean air energy, the taxonomy happening in in, in the in the um, in Europe, the understanding that may, maybe renewables won't necessarily do it all by themselves, right? Uh, and and there's certainly a lot more you know acceptance of nuclear power globally than there was. Yet we're still growing. Mm-hmm. And, and you know the reversal of shutdowns that are starting to happen or planned shutdowns. Um, I don't know. I don't know sure where these pounds are going to come from because they're not tomorrow's pounds. Like the pounds that are sitting in in the developers today, they're not going to be out six months from now. They're not going to be the only the only there's only two projects out there that you can really carry up up. Not Cigar Lake and Longer Heinrich, or not Cigar Lake, sorry, MacArthur River and Longer Heinrich. And to be fair, they're, they're not, those are just going to replace the pounds that came offline here in the last uh, eight, eight months or so with the requirements. So I don't see I don't see there being a savior. I don't see, you know, Kazazan problem was coming in at any cost, right? 
now you have investors saying, what are we going to invest in? Like, I want to return on my investment. The Canada problem just, there was cash flow. They had projects that, and yeah, they're the lowest cost projects in the world, um, but they were going to get built. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure who's, who, who, who's ready to turn on the taps uh, without an investor angle on things in the next, you know, it's not just, I'm going to make my money back. It's going to be, I'm going to make my money back and then some. I think what people real, failed to realize in the last cycle um, that didn't happen is just because the price went up, the, the majors and producers weren't able to ramp things up to the same degree because they had just been through a decade and a half of, of zero capital availability whatsoever. Uh, they were they were they were covering operating costs. They weren't able to keep sustaining costs. And what when the price moved last time, what did they invest in? They they invested in their infrastructure to remod, to not to to not even modernize it, just just to sustain it. And um, so you didn't see the chemicals of the world really increase production or the Iranos of the world really increase production because they were investing in their infrastructure that they had to let sit. And we're kind of in the same boat again. Mm-hmm. Makes a lot boat. of sense. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And what you're saying just sort of reinforced my belief, reinforces my belief that this is going to be, this bull run is going to go on for longer than, than the last one with higher sustained prices, like, you know, maybe in the 70s range, maybe even higher, triple digits, who knows. And if I look at the price right now, which is yet, it's, you know, it's not stimulating anybody to start a uranium business, like, I, I don't want to lose money, right? Um, and, and so I, it makes me think that we're still early in this cycle and that actually motivates one of my last questions here, cause we're going to start wrapping up cause I've taken too much of your time today, Roger, you've been generous, but if, if you were in my shoes right now, you know, net worth, say investable net worth, relatively low, no seven figures to invest. How would you, how would you approach this cycle from my standpoint? Would you focus like on one to let's say five explorers with, explosive potential. And as you said, what did you say? Like, you know, large enough land, uh, they've sniffed something out and they're already working on it with a strong technical team is what you told me what I wrote down. Is that what you would focus on? Or would you go for like a diversified portfolio in, you know, geopolitically diversified, but also diversified between developers, producers, uh, and so on and so forth? How would you approach this? Well, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to couch this a little bit. I'm going to ask you one question first. How yes. risk averse are you? It depends on your on your tolerance for risk, despite where you're at. So if you want uh, if you want to play the safe, not that any investment in the uranium world is is uh, GIC safe, because that's clearly not true. But if you want uh, to take on less risk, you do you take on the developers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you want to take on more risk and look at a multiple time, more than a than a couple times return on your investment, you go after those companies like you just said, the ones that are sitting and poised to make those next discoveries with the right technical team. Okay, but what if I want to become the next Adolf London? Then you wanna you want to invest in a portfolio of development opportunities. Okay, still. So you would not say like just go for the you know under twenty million dollars market cap and that's gonna get you there. Oh no, if you're risk tolerant, then that's where you put your money. And, okay. and if you and, and and you know, our company, the UEX, was that in 2005. We the value of our company went through the roof with the Shea Creek discovery, because mm-hmm. that was a discovery. When you look at Rough Rider, uh, sorry, Hathor or Fission or Next Gen, no matter where you are in the cycle coming up or down, flat, doesn't matter. New discovery will always outperform the developers and, and producers always because of the blue sky. So if you have the risk tolerance, then that's where you put your money. If you're going, yeah, I'm not, I, I want some risk, but I don't want to do that, if you want to become the next Lundin, you want to become the next producer. Okay. And so you need to have best in a basket of, of production, a bit groups that have sight lines to production. Mm-hmm. And if you want to take the least risk, you take on a project you like that's going to go into develop the next. It's probably the lowest cost, but the returns would be expected to be different, right? Yep. You, you get into an, a developer, you're, you're like a chemical, you have different risk profile than taking on a next gen. But that's a different profile than taking on uh, the most recent uh, exploration expo code. Mm-hmm. You know what they say: no guts, no glory. But if you, if you want to become the next, you know, out of Lundin, you might also want to get closer to a president. Um, <laughs> Roger, it's been a it's been a pleasure to talk to you. I've really I've taken too much of your time. Thank you for being so generous with your time, and I hope we can do this again soon. 
I hope so too. I, I appreciate your questions and 